Welcome to the Cube's coverage of KubeCon EU 2024, live from Paris, France. Join hosts Savannah Peterson, Dustin Kirkland, and Rob Strache as they interview some of the brightest minds in cloud native computing. Coverage of KubeCon Cloud Native Con is brought to you by Red Hat, CNCF, and its ecosystem partners. The Cube's coverage of KubeCon EU 2024 begins right now. Good evening, nerd fam, and welcome back to KubeCon Cloud Native Con here in wonderful Paris. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined by a really brilliant trifecta of men here. I've got Rob Streche, who's been killing it in the chair all day. We've got Dustin, who we are so lucky to have, and I feel blessed to match. And fabulous analyst guest, Sanjeev. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. being here. How's the show I, been for you so far? It's been outstanding. I am uh, so happy to be here. Yeah in Paris, of all the places. Of all the places for a work trip. I know. It's the yeah. best. Yeah, everybody, so, so funny thing is, everybody was so jealous I was going to Paris, except when I came here and NVIDIA GTC took off in San Jose, people were asking me, why are you in Paris? Why aren't you in San Jose? I'm like, come on. Paris, I mean, San Jose. <laughs> San Jose. Exactly. That's yeah. an easy call. Yeah, yeah, yeah call. exactly. My mother, actually, in one of the more flattering things she said to me recently, asked why, she wondered why I wasn't interviewing Jensen this week. Yeah. And I thought, well, you know, I got to go to Paris. Someone's yeah. got to go to Paris. Someone's oh, got to yeah, go. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> somebody's got to do the hard work, you know? Yeah. 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 yeah, but I mean, I think it's been great, I, I think, from a atmosphere perspective, we've been yeah. really seeing people leaning into how they're helping build <laughs> the communities here. Right. And I think like we had Dynatrace on earlier today and they were talking about how they've actually built a secure distribution of open telemetry yeah. that you can actually use with, don't have to use it with Dynatrace, yeah. you can just use it. Right. And I, I think people leaning in on that type of stuff and I was saying you know, before we went on, the data on Q Kubernetes day yep. zero yesterday was super interesting because we always talk about the intelligent data platform and they're showing how to go through, how are all the yeah. different open source, and how to make it easy. Now, we, we both know it's not that easy, but I think that's been, that sharing of knowledge this week is, I mean, even just into day two, I guess you could say, or yeah. day one official, uh, has been fantastic. Yeah. I, I feel the Kubernetes time has arrived. This is a very unique moment in its history. First of all, it's been 10 years. Yeah. In June, it'll be the 10th year since it was announced. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is that uh, with AI, so I, I think Kubernetes is in love, and being in Paris is the right place, and it's in love, it, there's a chromance going on. Kubernetes is in love with AI. Yeah. This is this is an amazing analogy. <laughs> I, 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 I did not know where you were going with this. I haven't associated <laughs> Kubernetes with love, although I kind of have yeah. a love story related to Kubernetes, which is <laughs> ironic, and now I'm just in a little cyclical circle. But but I but I think you're right. And we were actually just Dustin and I just had the opportunity when we were chatting with Priyanka, you know, Kubernetes is having its Linux moment. Yep. And I think, yeah, it's 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 cool to see this this ubiquitous. I mean, even the difference from KubeCon, I started working in container management with Kubernetes in, in uh, 2020, and just in the last four years, I mean, back then it was like, maybe we're going to do this, everyone's still using Docker, we're using all these different tools, and then now it just seems like there's been a whole industry acceptance and agreement, and, and to our earlier conversation, standardization essentially, that we're using Kubernetes. Yeah, one of the interesting things about all the, you know, the AI ML workloads that we're talking about is the flexibility of Kubernetes, the platform itself. I, I mean, 10 years ago, yeah. Kubernetes was the sexiest way to run web apps and databases, and moving off of, uh, you know, some of the more closed source uh, platforms as a service, yeah. moving on to something that you could self-host, you can run in your own data center, you can run in a different cloud or, or some other cloud, and that was great for the, you know, the rest, restful web app, mm -hmm. right? But that same system also now working with GPUs, being able to time share and slice and stack uh, workloads on those GPUs all, all through a scheduled container. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty yeah. remarkable. It so, is, it is. Yeah, yeah so, so what, what's happen, uh, happening is that because AI is working on tremendous amount of data, mm -hmm. which requires GPUs, so now. Kubernetes now has a new, uh, new purpose of, in life, yeah. which is how do you provision 
massive infrastructure and automate like self-healing, all the things that Kubernetes was good at and now it's found a purpose which is uh, helping yeah. with AI uh, GPU farms. So. And, and to me that's the Linux moment. The Linux to me is ubiquity. It's running on phones and laptops and desktops well, and servers yep. and space shuttles and everything yeah. you can watch is yeah. like everything you can possibly imagine. For something to have a Linux moment, it's got to be as ubiquitous as that in, in terms of its applicability. And, and that, that, well that's, that's, So I think one of the interesting things that we haven't hit on yet, and hasn't really been talked about too much, we, we kind of briefly hit on it, uh, is really that it's getting helped out a little bit by the VMware Broadcom acquisition as well. Because you have Kubevert, which is running virtual machines on Kubernetes oh, wow. natively. And that one is really, it's, it's lying there under the covers here today, but I haven't heard a lot about it this week. And I think that is where they're not cloud native apps, they're actual VMs living in harmony with cloud native apps. And I think that'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the course of the week. Uh, because that, yeah. that to me is the... It's an interesting observation. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up in, our, in one of our earlier segments. Because yeah. it, is, it is interesting how but, you know, this is a this is a grassroots style community. These are everyone here is a builder, a contributor, you know, and, and all the projects, hundreds of projects here. But I but I think that we we don't always highlight how the enterprise decisions or the big business decisions affect projects and, and mm. communities like CNCF. So I, I really thought that was an astute observation yeah. on your part. It is I this is an energetic thing. I mean Oh yeah. Uh, it's, High energy. Right? Yeah. I mean you know, this yeah. is it is it is six PM, it is the end of a, a long day with many yep. interviews. I'm Correct. still grooving. It's hard for me to believe it's already six. I wouldn't know it if there weren't cocktails happening behind us right now, which yeah. I'm also looking forward to. But you just, the vibe here, I wish I could bottle it up and share it with y'all at home. It is, it is so unique, because the energy is just, it, it's people who are building the future. Correct. And Correct. yeah, so I'm curious, you've been an analyst for a hot minute. You've got some experience and some depth. You don't look it. I, I meant that just as a, as a venerability compliment in terms of your brilliance. Right. But <laughs> what, are, what are some of the projects or use cases even of some of the projects that really yeah. excite you? Uh, one interesting thing that I've seen is that we know there's a scarcity of GPUs and GPUs are very expensive. If you can even buy the GPU, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Is anyone know, talking yeah, about GPUs? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's such a scarcity. So, so now there are uh, different options of running, doing LLM inference on chips that are not GPUs. Yep. Right. Doing it on the edge, like you mentioned, yes. like on your laptop, you can run a whole edge, LLM. Which is I, wild. It's wild. It's wild. It is, yeah. The amount of processing we can do on the edge right. now is, a, yeah. is a, a huge leap and bound that I right. don't know that we right. talked about enough, maybe just because I'm excited. And yeah. I, but I think, I think that also highlights the fact that Olama and Mistral yep. were on stage this morning, which right. we didn't really yep. talk about That's in our point. opening, and where people are looking for these models to be open. And right. I think that's a really interesting point as well, because yep. I, I, you look at Meta, you look at some of the others that are open sourcing, it, it yeah. does make a lot of sense because you have to trust the model right. that you're going to go then and train and you're going to fine tune and then use for inference. Yeah. Uh, and since CNCF is all about open source, so having open source models and CNCF come together is actually the right thing to do. So, yeah. And the other interesting thing that I also picked on is that, you know, when the whole DevOps movement started, the developer and the operations community came together. So I see there's some semblance of that happening now uh, here, because you've got the AI engineer, yep. and then you've got the operations people, you've got people who are doing research, and there's separate people, separate tools. Yep. But the thing is that the AI engineer doesn't give a damn as to what infrastructure is being used, how to even provision that hardware. Yeah. So, so there's, there were some announcements from Intel and, um, and Mistral about some dynamic resource allocation. So you don't have to hard code and say, give me two NVIDIA 
A100. That's kind of the, the flip side of, yes, there is a GPU scarcity a problem, yeah. uh, acquiring the GPU, getting the hardware, but there's also a GPU underutilization. I was going to say problem. the optimization uh, is the yeah. really big challenge. Yeah, yeah. and so you yeah. know, I think uh, just in the technical track this week, there's a, a number of changes that have happened in Kubernetes itself around uh, the schedulers, the NVIDIA uh, sponsored part of the keynote this morning was talking about four different layers of abstraction that allow for denser packing of workloads and higher utilization. So, you know, I think both of those are, you know, part and parcel, you know, they're, yeah. they're going together. Correct. Yep. Yeah, no, I think I, it, it's a good point that you bring up. And I, I, I do, coming back to this Linux moment thing, it, it feels like we're about to, as a community, hit a hyperscale moment. Yeah, I, I see that. Yeah. yeah. I feel like our conversation, say, in Salt Lake, for example, when we're at KubeCon in the US, will be potentially quite different. We will have a lot more of these applications out in the wild, serving real people, yeah. not just us nerds sitting here hanging out and talking about it. <laughs> yes, I, I think that you hit the nail on the head. It is, what, what are the benefits that, uh, you know, uh, Allianz or Mercedes-Benz, uh, what benefit the business derives is the key to success. Not what technologists, because we love technology, we right. spend all day tinkering around, but right. if it doesn't serve the business, then what's the point? And so it just costs money at that point, too. Yeah, this, it, getting into AI is not cheap. Yeah, yes. and I mean, we even had ABB on earlier today, oh, okay. and we, we were discussing about using Kubernetes at the edge in disconnected ways and right. looking at how as a packaging and distribution, right. it becomes a real, you know, a container is a really fabulous way to go and do that, but also then you have to have supportability, upgradeability, reliability, right. and the security that actually is under talked about here right. this week. And I think we'll hopefully do a better job with that tomorrow with having some people on, but I think it's one of these that they have their security con now slated for June, and so they've kind of pulled back on the security messaging here, which I think it, there has to be security built in mm. from the beginning, it's especially stable with this. And I, I think yeah. we, we did talk S bombs and supply chain and all of this earlier today, which I think is going to be another theme that we have for the rest of the week as well. I think that's a good observation, I do. I do think we'll have more conversations about it. I think the other thing is everybody knows security matters in this room, so it's yeah. less of a conversation, if that makes sense. There's kind of this baseline yeah. knowledge. Yeah. yeah. I, I was walking by and I saw a line which was like a one block long, people trying to get into a session. So I asked them, what session is this? It was like pitfalls or something about yeah. security. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Oh, yeah. 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 That's an interesting yeah. observation. It is table stakes, it but is. it's table stakes that when they aren't there, boy, it manifests itself in, in big ways. So, you know, let, let's let's talk about that. I mean, yeah. the, uh, the ubiquity where we're at with Kubernetes now, a security problem in Kubernetes now affects the world's 10 largest brands. Or, you know, Priyanka was it's sharing. It's a super yeah, good point. It's, you it, can't take it for granted. We no, you really can't. can't take it and, for granted. And, Things get messy real quick when we're moving at this velocity and scale, especially with things like AI. The, the tiniest breach could lead to absolute chaos pretty quickly. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion and questions on ethics, mm -hmm. responsible AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very important topic. Uh, and in fact, I've not seen a lot of coverage on AI governance. AI governance to me is a huge topic, and I've not seen that as yet. Like, what is Kubernetes' role in ensuring AI governance? You yeah. know, it's missing. I think it's like security. It's a great. There's it's a, a great less point. emphasis on that yeah. topic. So. Well, and it, it's quite possibly. I mean, here we are, a community of open source people who have agreed to a certain code of ethics and standards. It's exactly what we're going to need to do with AI, and 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 we're in Europe, which tends to come together oh, yeah. to create standardization right. in a very different way than the United States does. So I think that is a really interesting, that's a really interesting point you just brought up. I'm, well, I mean, I'm going to be noodling for that all week. Yeah. And I think building off of that, I mean, you just had the passage of the AI Act yes, here last, in the yeah, EU. 10 days ago. And yeah. you, yeah, exactly. you start to look at how people, and we've actually had a couple conversations about it, but it was, how do you have AI for good? Was one of the quotes that came out of right. this morning, and I, I think People here ha are, I, I, I like it because people are very positive about AI yeah. versus it's being not scared yeah. about Super true. You know, AGI what? or what have you. Yeah, one place I think 
the CNCF, Linux Foundation, this group in particular could offer real guidance on is some of the licenses. Uh, you know, what are the license implications Another, yeah. around the generated, you know, code, data sets, inferences. But right now it's kind of wild west. It, and know. it can get a little messy. I mean, Priyanka was talking about that in our last segment. No, I think yeah. that's really good. So there, I guess since I come from the data side, so I see things slightly different. I see two gaps. One is we just talked about security governance. I think there's not enough. The second thing that uh, I think they've missed is the importance of metadata. Why I say that is because CN CNCF published, so they have a working group. And uh, Priyanka mentioned uh, with QR code, please read our platform paper. I went through it line by line just to prepare myself uh, for, and so they talk about how the advantages of uh, Kubernetes as a platform and the layers of, you know, just like oh, we yeah. talked about the data, but there's no mention of, of uh, metadata. And I think uh, Kubernetes has a huge opportunity to bubble that up because once you have a metadata end-to-end, -end, you control it. You have full transparency, full visibility into that uh, yeah. ecosystem. And they missed it I, in that paper. I, and I think what's interesting is because they do talk, if you, if you go around and talk to some of the, you know, from uh, Spark to Trino and right. to Presto, they're going to, they're, uh, that paper talks about that kind of being the layer yeah. that does right. that. And I, right. they kind of leave it at that. And I think right. as we know, with an intelligent data platform, the metadata and yeah. federation, right. because you're going to have silos of data, but you have to have federated metadata other, yep. and governance across that because that's still, to your point, I don't know that that will get solved here. And I think that's, one of those things that it's going to be an interesting thing to see if yeah. something does start up around that. Because right. I think a lot of the organizations that have sponsored these are looking at that as their value add that they're bringing to it, specifically yeah. on the governance and specifically on the right. metadata management. So, so this, is, this is my theory. Any company that owns data, they own the customer. So AWS, Snowflake, Snowflake wants everything to come into Snowflake because once data is in Snowflake, where are you going to train it? You have to train where the data is because petabytes, exabytes. So you cannot yeah. move data around. Now, in the world of uh, Kubernetes, you don't own the data. Kubernetes is not going to own the data, but it can own the metadata. Right. And I, I, that, that uh, transition, uh, has not happened in CNCF because they don't think they're not data people. So hopefully if they watch this, then they'd be like, ooh, let's add metadata <laughs> to our yeah. platform. Yeah, someone's going to make a great business model out of everything yeah. that you've just talked about. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a 115th sandbox project, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Well, uh, the sun is quite literally setting here on yeah. Dustin's face and on <laughs> the end of day one. Rob, such a pleasure to sit here with you all day. Dustin as well, and so nice to have your insights. Such great I've calls I've been out, following Sanji. your Love videos. It. I was hoping you'll come with your Rubik's Cube earrings and I'm First glad time. I didn't let you down. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank yes. you so much for having me on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anytime. It's absolutely yeah. great. We've got an absolutely power-packed day for you on day two. We've got Docker, we've got Microsoft, we've got a WASM panel, more guests from Red Hat, and so much more. Thank you all for tuning in to theCUBE's live coverage from KubeCon, CloudNativeCon, here in Paris, France. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news. Mm -hmm.